separated from, uh, a cut above, you know, something that you, you, you hold in high regard. In, in Isaiah 6, just a little image of holiness, um, in Isaiah 6, Isaiah, the, one of the major prophets, is, is having a moment, and he's having a vision, and in this vision he sees these seraphs, which were angels, and the seraphs had six wings. And because they were flying around the, the throne of God, God sitting on the throne, they were flying around in his presence, what they did was, they, one set of wings covered their eyes, one set of wings covered their feet, and then they were flying with the other. And while they're flying around, they're declaring, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. So these angels in the presence of God are flying around saying, holy, holy, holy. Well, there's something in that three times saying it. In the Hebrew, in ancient Hebrew, as our kids learned with Daniel, the, they didn't use vowels. Another thing they didn't have was punctuation that we know. There wasn't an exclamation point. And they didn't have where they could do bold font, italicize, underline, and 15 exclamation points after. So what they did was they repeated things. So they repeated this. And Jesus does it in John quite often. He says, truly, truly, I say to you. So he's repeating something. He's taking that thing that he's saying and he's, he's making it more important. Like, hey, really, really be important. Everything in this book is important. So everything is on this level. And then the second time he says it, really pay attention. It means it's of crucial importance. So truly, truly, I say to you, it's crucially important. And then when we get to the three times, holy, 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 now it's super important. Super set apart. So two times is crucial, three times is super, it's way up there, all right? The other time in the Bible that, that uh, it's used, John in Revelations says, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. He's talking about those that are still in sin, that haven't accepted Christ, that are on the earth, and he's declaring major doom. He's like, woe, woe, woe. In the, in the Hebrew, it was oy vey. And the oy vey is translated into, I am undone. I am falling apart. You're going to fall apart, is what he's saying, big time. <laughs> because you don't want the Lord in that. So in holy, 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 he's also pointing to one other thing that we know very well, and that's the Trinity. God the Father is holy, God the Son is holy, and God the Spirit is holy. So three times he says, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. So it's important to understand that, because in the Bible, it never says God is love, love, love. It never says God is hope, 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 God is peace, peace, peace. God is holy, 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 and set apart. So then we come into matrimony, okay? I love this definition I found in Webster's, all right? The authority, Webster's Dictionary, gave this definition of matrimony. It says, I want to read it so I get it perfectly right, the union of a man and woman as husband and wife. That's Webster's Dictionary's definition of matrimony, what we know as marriage. The union of a man and a woman as husband and wife. Not man and man, or Adam and Steve, as you like to point out, or Angela and Eve. It's man and man. And so we want to make our, our marriage holy. How do we make our marriage holy? How do we set it apart? When we set that relationship with our spouse apart from all other relationships, is how we achieve holy matrimony. Turn the page. We must be sanctified. Here's that word we talked about. To be sanctified means to be made holy. The only way we can be made holy is by something holy itself. So the only way we can be made holy is if God makes us holy. And he did that with Christ dying and rising from the dead for us. So therefore, in believing, we become holy and we can make our marriage holy. So how do we set our marriage apart? In Leviticus, I love this verse, Leviticus 17, 26, it says, You shall be holy unto me. For I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from my peoples, that you should be mine. What a beautiful thing, God saying, you're mine, you're holy, I've set you apart from the other people. And I like to use this in my marriage, I like to say, Krista, you are holy unto me, I love you. I've set you apart, our relationship apart from all others, because I'm your husband. And it's a wonderful thing, and she can say the same to me, and that's how you set your marriage apart, in holy matrimony. There's other obvious ways you can do it, you know, a good idea would be to stop dating other people when you get married. You know, that's one way you can set your relationship with your spouse apart. You can stop betraying your spouse with lustful thoughts for other people. You know, how often does that dagger of lust hit us in the heart? And what you're really doing is you're committing adultery against your wife or against your husband. 
So guard against that. Pray about it. Give it to God. Spend more time with your spouse than with other people. And then there's some great ways to do it. If you're in a relationship, if you're just dating with do devotions. We do, do daily devotions with my wife. My wife and I started, and it's awesome. It's empowering. And then the last way that we can do it is pray together. What an awesome way to set your marriage apart from other relationships is to get on your knees before the Lord and pray with your spouse. And I'm not talking about the table prayer. You know, like, you know, you do that. I'm talking about really getting down and exposing your heart to your loved one to God together is powerful. Powerful. I have an illustration. You know, Krista in our life hasn't always been, been holy. Why hasn't always been holy? Because we haven't always been followers of Christ. 7 11 2012 was a great day for me. I won't ever forget it. Because that's the day my wife called me and said I accepted Jesus. And now my marriage is holy. We're working on getting her to get her baptized because she's a little, she, she doesn't have the gift of gap. She doesn't want to come up here and talk in front of people. <laughs> she's a little nervous about that. But sometime in August, we're going to get her baptized. And it takes marital maturity. Some of the things that Pastor Rob's been preaching on in that tri uh, trials in life. Marital maturity comes through holiness, through praying, and it's coming before God. The second point I have is loving God's way. God tells us how to love. In the Hebrew, there are three words for love. In Greek, there's even more than that. In English, we have one. So in the same breath that I say, I love my wife, I love my children, I can say, I love cheeseburgers. I love Hawkeye football. I love giving Rob a hard time about the Packers. <laughs> and these are things. So it kind of, to me, it loses meaning, just the one word, love. So in Hebrew, there are three words. But before we get to that, in John, 1 John 4, 7 and 8, dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves God has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not know God does not love because God is love. God is love. So in setting your marriage apart and having that relationship with your spouse, if you don't know God, you don't really love each other. You might think you do. You have strong feelings for each other, but you can't actually love someone unless you know God. Because God is love. Right in Scripture, God is love. So in the Hebrew, the three words that are kind of fun, and I like them, first one's raya. Raya means a friendship. We have a friendship. We have raya love for each other. We have friendship. The second word is ahaba. Love that word. It's kind of ahaba. It rolls off the tongue. And that's a deeper commitment. That's a deeper love for one another. And we'll take it to the next level. And then the final one is dod. And dod is that intimate, passionate love. It includes, you know, just that, that, that knowing everything about each other. Chris and I, we know everything about each other. And it's that deep love, and it also includes the, the sexual aspect of love, of marriage, the way God designed it. One of my favorite things is my father in law is a math guy, and I'm not a math person. He taught math at the Luther College in Decor for 40 years, and, and for once in my life, I get to prove his, his laws of mathematics wrong. And I love it. It's kind of fun, man, this little enjoying things. Well, in, in, in God's law of mathematics, one plus one equals one. I'm going to put it wrong. You know, and everything else, it's five plus five equals ten. Six minus three is three. Those are laws of mathematics until God gets involved. The two shall become one is what God says. One plus one is one. In Matthew 19, verses four through six, it illustrates this. Jesus is talking, and he says, at the beginning, the creator, and in the scripture, it uses the word Elohim, which is God, a name for God for his creative power. He says, at the beginning, Elohim made them male and female and said, for this reason, man will leave his father and mother. <coughs> for what reason? For her, man will leave his mother and father. That's what he said. For her, for her love or loves, if you use the three Hebrew for her. God created us this way and to make it holy, we do it the way God wants it, in holiness. So in this first part, God's talking about, Jesus is saying, hey, this is your raya. This is your ahava loves, right here. And then he goes on and he says, and be united to his wife and they are no longer two, but one flesh. So that they are no longer two, but one. Anybody else catch that? Jesus said it twice in succession. He said, they are no longer two but one. They are no longer two but one. He said it twice in succession. So it's critically important that we realize that. That's right from Jesus. Critical importance. 
And then this is where the dough comes in. The two can become one flesh. There's obviously the sex part of it, but there's that intimacy that I was talking about too, about praying with your spouse, of getting on your knees before the Lord and laying it all out there. That's dough love, that's intimacy. Nobody else knows the things that my wife and I pray about. Get on our knees and, and, and just humble ourselves to each other and to God, and it is powerful. When our marriage is sanctified through Christ, there's no, no limit to what we can do with it. In my house, we have this thing, or I have this thing. And it, you know, we joke about football. So in football, who knows what this means? When you see the guys on the sidelines going like this, or on the field running to the other end, it means I own the fourth quarter. That's ours. We own the fourth quarter. Well, each morning, I wake up in my house, and sometimes I do it literally, and sometimes I just do it in my heart. I do this in the morning doesn't mean there's a fifth quarter. <laughs> it means I'm number five. This is my daily reminder. And this is how I'm setting my relationship with my wife and my kids apart. I am number five. God is number one. My wife is number two. My kids are tied for three. And that leaves me down here at number five. And to set that relationship apart, I remind myself that I'm number five. During PBS, I had a, I had a let down. I let my wife down. We were here and then Daniel had just jumped in the lion's den and the kids went off and he needed to sneak out to his house. I was like, oh, I'll take you out. I'll, I'll run blocker for you. Make sure no kids see you because I couldn't see him until the next day. And so I go with him and we go down to his house and we sat down. We're having a good conversation. We're talking about my baptism coming up and some theological things and praying together and whatnot. My phone kept buzzing. I'm like, oh, it's Krista. It's Krista. You know, she's at the church. Well, here I left my wife who at the time was an unbeliever in a strange place. We don't really know a lot of people yet. And she was getting madder and madder by the minute because I didn't hold my relationship with her above all others. And finally, I got the phone call and the message that, hey, I'm leaving, I'm walking home. I let her down. And that just stung. It stung me. We had a fight, we argued, and then we got together again and prayed. And realized that, you know, I was wrong. So I didn't set my relationship apart. I didn't have holy matrimony. I didn't have her in the highest regard. So set your marriage apart by sacrifice is point number three. Marriage is work. Anybody that's married think otherwise? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> Just gave you an example. Uh, my grandfather, there are three men in my life that mold me into who I am. My grandfather is one of them. My father and my uncle Bob is the other. And Grandpa Bud was a, a, a really great man. Hard worker, loving, raised us. To know, to know the Lord. And he was dying of cancer in 93. I got to come home and march in a parade with him. I was in the Air Force at the time and we marched in his BFW uniform and me and my military <coughs> and dress blues. We marched together in this parade. And after we spent some quality time together and he was pretty sick and, and knew that things were coming, he goes, I know you're nowhere near getting married, Devin. He goes, but I want you to take this advice. Just always remember that marriage is work. It's not all sunshine and roses. It's not all like your honeymoon. There's going to be times where you guys struggle together, and that's where we got to go before God. We've got to get right with the Lord and get right with each other, and I will always hold that. Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes that many of those who marry, it doesn't say many, I'm sorry, it says, but those that marry will face many troubles in this life. I mean, he lays it out, You're gonna, we're going to have troubles, we're married, this is going to be work. <laughs> sorry, it's not going to be easy all the time. So if you're in these relationships, it's going to be work. One of the things I like to look at, we're going to stay on the football analogy, is teamwork. In Ephesians 5, uh, they kind of they lay out the, the, the foundation, the groundwork for a marriage. And it's a teamwork thing. And like a team, a team has a head coach. Our head coach is God. He's in charge. And then in Ephesians 5, it says we need a quarterback. And this is, the man's going to be the quarterback. It's going to call the place for the family. That doesn't mean he's going to disregard the tailback, his wife. It means that as the quarterback of the team, God has put me in charge of calling the play and being willing to hand the ball off to my wife and say, run with it, Krista. Run with it. I'll run out and throw a block for you. We're a team. We work together. In these hard times, we're going to get through them. You know, everybody knows without a good, good running game, passing game isn't any good anyway, so I need a good... I need to get running back. You know, God gives us another example in the Bible about marriage. 
mean, Jesus calls us his bride, the church his bride. If that doesn't tell you how we should hold marriage, I don't know what we will. I mean, it's this parallel. It's saying, look, I am the groom, you are the bride, I'm the church. I, I'm the head of the church, just like the man's the head of the wife. But I love you. I will do anything for you. He was the servant God. He came to earth to serve us. Wash people's feet. He did these things. He was a servant God. And that's how we're supposed to be as husbands to our wives and wives. You're supposed to respect your husband too. And it's a, it's a two-way street. It's a team. We work together. We work together. But what a wonderful gift marriage is. What a wonderful gift God has given us. You know, he knew in the garden. And he preached about it a little bit yesterday. That he knew then. He said, you know what, Adam? Something's not right with you. You're not complete. I'm going to make somebody to make you complete. And gave him Eve. And so God has somebody for us. I'm going to kind of recap my points for the praise band. wants to make their way back up front. That'll work. Give you a little heads up. My first point was set your marriage apart from sin. Okay, by setting that apart, you understand what holiness is and what it means to have holy matrimony. The second part is to love each other by setting your marriage apart from yourself by loving each other God's way. The way God teaches us to love. I right, perfect. And the third way is set your marriage apart by sacrifice and being willing to work. It's not always easy going shoe shopping, but I do it. <laughs> it's not always easy watching the chick flick, but I do it because I sacrifice for my wife. I can't get her to watch football with me yet, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Finally, I want to challenge you, and there's a challenge in the Bible that I really like. We kind of talked about it at the last men's group. It's 1 Corinthians 7:29. Those are of you who have wives should live like you had none. There's multiple meetings here. It doesn't mean God says we should go out and start dating other people. That's not the meaning. That's not what he means. It means those of you that have wives should live as you have none. Because in the Bible, God talks about that you're not focused completely on God when you're married. I have a wife. I have responsibilities. My wife, my children, you, wife, children, one kind of one less, son-in-law now. You know, we have to live like we aren't married. And so I want to challenge you this, and I want you to think of it this way, that verse this way. Remember when you were dating? Remember how hard you fought to win her love or win his? All those little things you did. So I'm challenging you to do those things to try to renew and refresh your marriage. Live like you're dating. I'm opening the door for her. I can't, I'll be honest, I don't remember last time I opened the door for her. I mean, in the car or something. we got to get the kids out. Try to live like you're dating. That's my gear for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your love. You are holy, set apart from all things, Lord. We just praise you and thank you for the gift of companionship. Lord, we praise you for the opportunity to worship you today. Lord, as we go forth, I just pray that we, we focus on you and remember where we are in our relationship, whether we're number one, number two, number ten. Help us remember that you're number one, and at the very most, remember to serve you. In our relationships, Lord, remind us that we need to put the other person's needs first. Lord, and I just pray that we all work together in our relationships. And when we come together in you, Lord, there's no limit to what we can achieve. Lord, we just thank you for the gift of marriage, and we pray for Jessica and Nate and their new love, their new life together. We just thank you for that. Lord, we pray all these things according to your will, and in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Brother Devin, for bringing that message to us today. Let's all applaud the honor of God. Let's all send the worship.